Hey YouTube, first off I want to say thanks for the amazing reception on my short little linear motor video. Um, I never really expected anyone to see that video at all. Um, I put it on YouTube pretty much as a way to share the file with myself and I looked back and saw 330,000 views and 4,500 comments. I was kind of floored. Now, a lot of the comments were asking for more information or how this part was interacting with that part or what was what. So I'm going to make this into a much more useful video now that I know people might actually watch it. <laughs> um, I'm going to do this as sort of an overview of the project, um, talk a little bit about each and every piece. But um, then I want to do a nine part series where we talk about the core in one video. We talk about the coils in one video. Um, you know, the, the power, how everything works, um, those will have diagrams and, you know, those type things. Um, we'll do some fun experiments along the way. We can make some, you know, little electromagnets and, and play with those and mess with, uh, you know, iron powder and stuff like that. Uh, then we will actually, just one of the videos, we will actually rewind this motor completely and take it from pieces back up into the system you see here. Um, you can absolutely build one of these yourself if you were so interested. Um, and um, I want to make this uh, I want to make this video for everybody that sent in all those comments. <laughs> now I know it's kind of overdone in these videos, but I'm trying to get this channel up and going. So if you don't mind, go ahead and hit that subscribe button for me. You know, right right in there. <laughs> and um, I really appreciate that if you do that for me. All right, before we get to too far into this, let's talk safety. Here we've got 120 volt AC power, at least in the US, coming out of the wall, right? Um, so think electrical safety, right? You don't stick your hand in a power outlet, so don't stick your hand in the power supply, right? Um, I'm gonna bring this little camera over here and give you a view inside the power supply there. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, you know, the point is, you know, this this VFD, it's running off of, you know, wall power. Treat it like any other thing that you would plug into the wall, right? It may even be worse because there, you know, there's a little bit of exposed wire there, you know. So, um, now, the motor itself can get pretty warm whenever you're running it, okay? We've got a lot of current traveling around wires, right? So those wires are going to start to get warm. And since there's a bunch of wires packed in a small little area, they're all going to start getting warm. And that's going to make the coils get really hot. And then the core itself can start getting hot. The secondary can start getting hot. Um, depending on your application, if you want this thing to run continuously, you may need to consider some sort of cooling system with it or... Um, you know, use heavier gauge wire so that they can handle the heat better and that kind of thing, you know. Um, that being all said, you know, build this at your own risk. Um, it's really an informational video. If you're not comfortable with any of the concepts or pieces or parts of this project, you know, find somebody with more uh, experience messing with electricity and they'll help, they'll take care of you. All right, let's run the motor and let's see what got us to this point. So I'm going to flip on the power supply with my foot down there. Yep, okay, that'll take just a second to come on. Well, what we're going to do is create a traveling magnetic field, okay? The magnetic field is going to move along this core section. And then this piece of aluminum, we're going to... Um, it's non-magnetic, but it is a very good conductor. So we're going to sort of pass current along it, and we're going to create a field around it. And then that field is going to push off of each individual, you know, uh, magnetic field as it move as the magnetic fields travel down the core. Okay. Get this camera all positioned. I'm going to hit run on this, and I'm going to turn this uh, little knob here. And we're going to start getting RPMs. You can probably hear it start to buzz now. Eventually, the Aluminum will start to lift off. Okay, so I'm holding it, but it is now floating. So I'm just going to move the camera around that. Okay. And then if I let go of it, of course, the secondary will take off. I'm going to do that a couple times. It's kind of fun. Okay, I'm going to hit stop. And that's kind of annoying, so I'm going to turn that off much quieter. <laughs> okay. So that whining you heard, um, that was the coils vibrating. You can see everything right now is just in here loose, and these are getting a little warm already. Um, but um, 
you know, all that's loose in a real motor, you would cover all of that in resin so none of that can move around and it'll be like completely silent. Let's see. Uh, this was a school project I started out. Um, I thought the linear induction idea was really neat um, and I wanted to get uh, some more information on it, but I couldn't really find good sources. The sources I found, it felt like they were written in alien language, you know. So I want this video series to be a very accessible thing. You know, you can go really deep into Maxwell's equations and things to talk about magnetism. But for the most part, we don't need to know all of that to make this system work. Um, now, the linear motor is just like a round motor. It's just been cut and laid out flat. The bottom piece with the coils here. We call that the stator because typically in the motor, um, in the round motor, it's going to be the piece that is sort of attached to the housing and doesn't move. It's the piece with the coils. Okay. This piece of aluminum would be round and it would be rotating inside. And this is what the output shaft would be hooked to. And since it rotates in a round motor, they call it a rotor. But since we've laid it out flat and it's going to move linearly, we're just going to call it the secondary. So we got the primary, the secondary. We call it the core, the coils, right? So there's some vocabulary. Um, let's talk design. So I began by mimicking the designs I saw online, just, um, you know, monkey see, monkey do. I, I decided on this sort of layout. Um, so I took it and put it into AutoCAD, and then I 3D printed it um, so I could get a feel of it in real space. Um, this was the exact dimensions I was going to use at the time, and... Um, you can see this thicker wire that I have on here now. This is 16 gauge wire. So I wanted to see how many pieces of 16 gauge wire would go in one of those slots. Okay, the um, idea here is that slots number one, two, and three will only have a single coil resting in those slots. But slots four, five, and six are going to have a second coil stacked on top of it. So I needed to see how many wires would fit in a single slot, and then I divided that number by two to see how many, um, how many wires I could have or loops I could have in each coil. Okay. Now many people ask about the layout of the coils. All right, you can see six wires coming out of my variable frequency drive here. Okay, and you can. Okay, essentially we've got here phase. You know, one A, two A, one B, two B, one C, two C. You know, three phase power coming out of here, but I, I'm taking it out twice, so it's just um, just two sets of the three phases all running in parallel. So that runs along here to the motor. The they do their loops inside the coils, and then they come out here to a common point. And this common point is just all tied together. We call that a Y connection. And that works because each of these coils should be identical. And so the motor kind of sees them all as just a completely balanced load. Um, since it's a completely balanced load, we don't need a return path. Um, the idea, we'll get into it more with diagrams and things, but the idea here is that as one... Uh, phase is at its peak, the other two phases are sort of near their negative one half. And if you add all that together with vectors, you end up getting a net sum of zero. So there is nothing coming back out of the motor that isn't going through one of the phases itself. And like I said, we'll talk about that more in the coil or the power video. Let's see, that... Uh, you know, that, that large wire was really great, and you can actually see on the channel there is a video where I show the motor running when it had this very large gauge, gauge wire in, uh, in the slots. Um, didn't make a whole lot of force. I was, you know, kind of underwhelmed, right? Um, but if you remember back to your electronic days and the um, linear, um, well, the inductive formulas for... Magnemit magnetomotive force. Magnemotive force. <laughs> Magnetomotive force. Uh, it is the amount of current times the number of turns that you have in your coil. Okay, so this VFD, it's kind of limited to 15 amps of uh, current, 
And so I had a, you know, 15 amps times a limited number of turns. So what I did was I went down to a smaller gauge wire. That let me go from maybe, you know, 10 turns in a coil to like 150 turns in a coil. So same amount of current times 150 compared to the same amount of current times 10. Obviously, this one gives me a lot more force. And you can see, you know, in this video and my previous video that got all the, all the views, um, you know, this one is stronger than the one with large gauge wire. I actually want to, in this series, I want to rewind the motor for you, and I want to use 34 gauge wire. So this is very, very thin. You can see it right there. If you can see it, I'm going to get a close-up of it real quick. So 34 gauge wire. It's, a, it's almost like the thickness of a human hair. Um, it's about that thick. Um, obviously, since this is much thinner wire, I won't be able to carry the full current on a single wire like I have here, so I may have to double up the amount of, you know, loops I get. But I should be able to get a lot more turns with that, um, with that gauge wire. Now, um, when I was winding the motor, I was having some trouble. Okay, so I started out, as most of you might think, right, wrap the coils around something round, and then you can just pull them off of there and put them in their spot. But these spots are rectangular. They're not round. <laughs> so whenever I was putting the coils on here, I was having to bend them by hand, you know, and I, trying to get four corners bent perfect out of a circle is just nearly impossible. So I um, went through my, um, through my uh, AutoCAD and I just sort of made out these little parts and made sure that they would function together. The idea here being that you kind of widen this out to the size that you need and then tighten this down. Then you can wrap square coils. So now or rectangular coils, right? So now whenever you pull them off of here, you just slide this piece back up and you can pull the coil off. And whenever you go to put them on the motor core, they fit really nicely because they're already the right shape. Um, and that worked out pretty good. That tool could use some serious work. <laughs> It, um, I would not, I would probably not make this first piece move at all. And then I would make this piece, um, a captive bolt system because right now you can see if I pull these two pieces apart, the bolt will just like move all over the place. Right. And that's kind of a pain. So, um, you know, great first attempt on my part, but I, I would, I would do some work on this. Okay, let's see. The insulation paper you see here, the blue, the blue paper near the coils, um, it's just Nomex paper, so it's just a really high temperature paper. Whenever you, you know, you saw and heard those coils vibrating all over the place, well, if they were just allowed to touch the metal, they would rub off their coating very quickly. So we use some sort of insulation paper to keep them from rubbing against the metal. Um, it's also, like I said, a very high temperature paper, so it won't catch on fire as the coils get very warm while they're in the motor. Then the piece that's along the top is called a top stick. And essentially, you can get these in a bunch of different shapes, but um, I just took some and I sort of flattened them out and um, almost inverted them to hold the, my coils down into the slots. That's really what the top stick is for, is to hold the coils down in the slots. Um, now, the bad part about those are you can't buy just one or two, all right? They want to sell you like a hundred of these things. Um, you know, luckily they don't cost a lot, you know, and I guess that's why they want to sell you a hundred of them at a time. Um, but, you know, you're going you're gonna to have extras on those. Try to make sure you get the design that you want the first time because you don't want 200 of these things sitting around after you have to reorder. Now, the core itself, let's get rid of this secondary, get out a piece of the core. So the core itself, all right, that's the sort of shape of it right there. Let me get a good close-up of it. There we go. Nice, pretty close-up. Okay. Now, uh, this was a plasma cut out of a piece of just plain old steel. There are, um, as I understand, some steel alloys that have a like 1, 2, 3% of silicon mixed in, and those apparently are pretty good at conducting flux even better than just plain old steel. Still, plain old steel is about 2,000 times better than air, so, you know, anything, any kind of metal would be better than no metal. 
Um, but you can see as this was cut out, whenever the plasma cutter went around these corners, it really pitted out the corners. Now, for my particular application, I was like, okay, this is not pretty, but it, it should be fine. You know, I'm not getting these recut. Um, but I would suggest um, if you have the availability, do a water jet cut instead of a plasma cut due to like the small size of the corners and things. Um, there are two holes in each core piece so that I can slide a bolt through to hold the cores together. Um, and essentially, these things, they're about a cent thick and they just stack until you get the desired width of your core. Now, um, there is a point to making it out of slices. You would never want to make this out of a solid piece. Essentially, while the flux lines are going down the motor, this way, like down the motor, it's going to be causing currents to flow in circular patterns. We call those eddy currents. And think about like an eddy current in a stream, right? It's just little currents that are just sort of meandering in circles all around this place. But think about it as you have current going through that metal that's causing heat and causing power loss. So someone really smart decided that you could split the core up into multiple slices and actually insulate them from each other. So I know it looks like all of my pieces of metal are just touching metal to metal to metal, but they're not. Um, we use some sort of insulation. In this case, I used a spray called Epoxy Light Insole Spray 7001. It says air drying electrical insulating enamel. So I've essentially, I have sprayed and not in your hand, right? Because that stuff is, you know, probably not the best chemical you want all over you. Um, I did them on the ground, but... I sprayed each one of the core pieces, and then I stacked them up and put bolts through them to hold them together. Okay, and then, you know, that means that none of the metal pieces of the core are actually touching any of the other metal pieces of the core, right? So that's a kind of an important idea of making your core. Uh, let's see. Um, nowadays, of course, all motor cores and all transformer cores, they're all made out of those slices. And like I said, I used about an eighth inch just because that was going to be really easy for my people to, my fabricators to make. And I also didn't have to deal with like 10,000 individual pieces of metal that needed to be sprayed and put together, right? Um, so eighth inch just seemed fine for me. It works. Um, obviously, the smaller you make them, the better. But who wants to do, you know, 10,000 little pieces, right? Let's see. So now the power system, it is a variable frequency drive, Okay. Essentially, in America, you should get 120 volts of AC, single-phase electricity, out of your um, wall outlets. This machine, all it does is it takes the AC and it breaks it down into DC, so it's nice and flat. Then, using an internal microcontroller, it builds up phases that are exactly um, 120 degrees apart, which gives you three phases in every rotation. Okay, um, there are a couple of other ways to get three phase out of one phase, but this is a nice, simple option. Let's, uh, let's say you have a drill in your wood shop, and it needs three phase, but all you have is regular outlets in your um, shop. You can buy one of these, and it will power that motor properly. Now, this exact one, it's actually limited to only 15 amps output, so... You know, that's a, that's kind of one of my limiting factors. But you can get these in all different, you know, configurations and current, you know, current handling abilities and everything. Um, but we'll talk about this in its own video because the, you know, you kind of need some graphs and things to understand what's going on there. But um, cool parts are that, you know, with just the push of a button, you know, we just saw the metal move this way. Well, I can make the metal move this way instead of going, you know, a, B, C, D, E, it'll go, you know, A, B, C, D, E this way. Okay. Let's see. Well, that was a quick overview of my linear motor build. Like I said, we will be breaking down that even further in a video series, so stay tuned for that. Um, yet another chance for you to hit that subscribe button if you haven't. <laughs> and um, I'll see you in the next one.